Welcome to the Beyond Banking Podcast. This week we have a real treat for you. I've been collaborating with this uh, expert um, and advisor for a number of years now on our other podcasts, um, Breaking Banks and The Futurists, and every time it results in a truly fascinating conversation. And given that, you know, a commercial banker Dubai, CBD Talks, who's sponsoring uh, this, has made a big commitment to AI. And generally what we see in the, um, the Middle East region, in the GCC region, a renewed focus on development of the future. It's uh, particularly uh, um, a useful conversation with it if we take um, the Vision 2030 view in Saudi and the commitments that the UAE government have made to uh, automation and technology more generally, then this is the guy we wanna to talk to about where AI is gonna affect our culture and uh, how these things are, are changing. And it'll be good to get some definitions. Now we've got also, of course, the CEO of CBD, um, who uh, will appear on an upcoming episode, um, who has a PhD in artificial intelligence. And so obviously it's aligned. So let's get into how AI is gonna develop in the region and, and you know, how it's developing more globally and what is likely gonna be the impact culturally and otherwise in respect to AI in our daily lives, because that's really what people are interested in talking about. Brian Romley, welcome to Beyond Banking. Brett, thank you so much. An honor to be here. I mean, looks like we've been going back now almost a decade talking about banking and technology, voice first, and now into full-blown local and cloud AI. So it's an honor to be here. Absolutely. No, it has been uh, a while. You recently appeared on Jordan Peterson's um, yeah. podcast talking with him about artificial intelligence. Maybe let's start with that story. How did that come about? Uh, I was so honored by uh, a reach out by Jordan's staff, and he had been following a lot of my work apparently for quite a long time, and I was unaware of it. And uh, he wanted an emergency uh, interview, and that happened at one o'clock in the morning, uh, California time. And we got a studio at my local church that just phenomenal that they were there, and we did a simulcast he was somewhere in uh europe on tour but he wanted to get it out there and he is a phenomenal uh mind when it comes to understanding the psychology that has gone into building ai because ai is a low resolution pixelated version of the part of the brain that invented language so when we're talking to ai we're in many ways reflecting back on the history of the development of human language, human psychology, and the concept of intelligence is, is challenged because what we mm -hmm. thought was intelligence may be something different. I'm not saying it's not intelligence. And Jordan found that really fascinating. And I'm one of the few people at this point that is really diving into that element of it because it's not mathematics. It's not necessarily STEM. It comes yeah. from a completely different discipline of understanding. Now, um, you know, apart from the fact that obviously you're in discussion about this and you consult with various uh, companies on artificial intelligence, you've also been working on over the last decade, a concept you call the wisdom keeper, which is a, an attempt to sort of capture um, not the, not consciousness itself, but, some of the behavioral and output elements of, of consciousness as sort of an extension to your own consciousness. I, I mean, I don't want to sort of put the words in, in your mouth, but <laughs> can you talk about this concept of, because this is sort of, it, it almost predates LLM sort of thinking as well, is how, how did you decide to go down this path of creating an extension to your own conscious, consciousness with a, a sort of primitive form of AI? Wow, uh, Brett, thank you. You know, uh, it really started in 1979 when I was starting to build my very first expert system. And they're so crude right now. I used to call it AI. And I knew it was wrong because it really wasn't artificial intelligence, but it just made me feel better. Uh, they were really just uh, sophisticated databases. But they were built on the concept of taking pieces of memory 
and to try to m memorialize it and in some ways make that memory immortal. Uh, I, of course, science fiction grew up with it just like yourself. You know, there was that prim premonition that maybe we might be able to capture some of the essences of the human experience that we've all gone through. So it's been a lifelong mission and it have been peaks and valleys. You know, it becomes very depressing with the technology is in keeping up with, you know, your ambitions. So I would dive into it, head forth, maximize what that technology would do, sort of hit the wall, get disappointed, dive into other things and come back to it. In 2012, I started to see a whole new concept of, of what AI could be. And it came from the voice synthesis aspect of um, machine learning. Uh, we were able to understand how to better understand uh, what somebody is saying and even to create voice by using essentially the technology, the generative technologies that became large language models. And when I saw the, 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 the bit of that, I dove into it very deeply and I started really planning out what these devices will look like. So there's two components, the intelligence amplifier, which is kind of with you while you're around, it's collecting information uh, with the right social contract. It's recording everything that you're interacting with, including people. But it, you know, there's promises and barriers to using that video and audio as a as a uh, sort of way to record what you're doing in your life, uh, as much as trying to envelop the context of your life. And what, what was the synopsis of what took place in that conversation, not an exact photocopy of that conversation, which we know large language models don't photocopy anything. Mm -hmm. They're associations of things. So that's the intelligence amplifier. So the wisdom keeper is the sum total of that, maybe sustains while you're alive, but definitely when you're gone, when you leave this place, it's a sum total of all your experiences. Now I started this free open source concept called savewisdom.org where anybody can get a voice memo recorder or their phone and start answering the thousand questions that we've developed. Some of them are redundant on purpose and it's designed to do two things. Number one, it's designed to record your voice so that we have sampling of your voice. It doesn't take a thousand questions to do that. Number two, to memorialize your feelings from different experiences, the Maslow peaks and valleys of your life, so that the AI model that we ultimately build on that, or you ultimately build yourself, because it'll be on your local computer, you can now have a version of your experiences, which really define us, Brett, on who we become and how we react to things. And the large language models know this. They know that predicated on certain experiences you've had, certain things that will happen in the future, it can sort of predict your reactions to them. Now, that's a good and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it can guide you to maybe better thought processes, maybe breaking you out of bubbles, maybe breaking you out of loops. But on the other side of that, it also helps guide you to the, to the path that you really are on. Hopefully that path is to serve the world, yourself, your family in, in a much better way. And along the way, there are different things that come at us that, that knock us off the trail. And this could very well do that. So that's what we do. Uh, quite a few, now we're approaching probably, I think maybe 25, 30,000 people who have notified us that they are now answering the thousand questions. One final thing that it does, and I warn anybody that does this, it will be a very emotional experience. Uh, mm -hmm. We tell you to lock yourself in your car or closet or in a room, and put out all your all your emotions on these questions, because that's the only way, number one, the AI models will get the real true emotional context, which very soon we'll be able to extract that. But number two, if you were to send this off into the future with your family, that context has become more and more valuable. In fact, more valuable than gold. Our first person experiences of the world today now, the thousand questions are the start, but if we are successful in proving how valuable this is, you'll start doing this on a regular basis. You'll start mm -hmm. feeding your context, not in a cloud, on your own computer. 
And this is, um, and, you know, an interesting point because, you know, when we talk about these LLMs, there's a lot of debate and we see it coming in legislation now around um, the issue of data collection um, and the use of that as sort of a, a mass media or a mass uh, um, tool for uh, creating creating these LLMs. But you're talking about localized um traction here you're talking about localized data collection and so give us your thoughts in terms of where ai platforms are going to go particularly in respect to personalized ai how do we navigate this difference between sort of these large learning models or large language models that are trying to collect as much data as possible to get as accurate conversational capabilities and so forth as possible and then the concept of a personal AI that's going to sit with you and be an extension of your consciousness that will act on as an agent on your behalf and that you say might sit on your smartphone or in your personal cloud. Yeah, uh, wonderful concept here. So the dichotomy between cloud-based AI and local AI is quite large. It's easy for us to con conflate them in these early days, but we are already well past information overload as individuals, no matter how, you know, how much of a diet you put yourself on with information, you're overloaded. Um, most of humanity, if you were to take the arc of humanity, in the 1870s, the average person would have the information in a year that's in a typical New York Times or Wall Street Journal. So that information overload, we're not evolving fast enough to be able to to discern and to find let's not necessarily say truth but finding a path through this information truth may never ever come i mean this is mm. the 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 unfortunate thing about it but if you have a personal ai that's going out and discerning things that you should know along with a great deal of novelty so that you're not in an echo chamber that you're actually getting novel opinions from other polar opposite views of yours. Uh, the AI that we're developing right now, and I've had for quite a while, but I'm trying to get this out more uh, in, in open source, is to be able to find the times and the places where opposite ideas of novelty get interjected. This stimulates your brain, it stimulates your creativity, and it stimulates your view to be able to see the world through new eyes. And Social media hasn't done that. We've siloed ourselves and every year it gets smaller and smaller until you identify as one thing. And right. humanity is very never tribal, done that. Uh, you know, very tribal. Sort of, yeah. And, and, and you've covered this in your books, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, how can you open the minds up to the future if you've thinned yourself down to this one single thread of a view and then you lock yourself into it because you aggressively think? that somebody is trying to take that view away from you. Yeah, yeah, some are, but really it's it's your not ability to see it. And personal AI will help you. Cloud AI, on the other hand, may not help you very much because you don't have control over the tuning of that model, the agenda of that model, and the direction that model is gonna go with. And it's changing daily, Brett. Uh, prompts mm. that I used on OpenAI in the early days on 3.5, are no longer working to the same level for my clients, corporate clients, uh, that they worked, you know, three months ago. So this makes it quite concerning. We call this prompt drift or model drift and a drifting. And last, uh, I think last week, OpenAI on their own personal X account said, we are experiencing a very reduced uh, response uh, window, meaning Instead of being verbose about answering something, it'll say one paragraph and say, look it up on Google, basically. Wow. And this is very concerning. And, and OpenAI is making the claim they don't know why the model is essentially stopping what it was supposed to be doing. I have some of my own theories, but you know that's that, that could take a whole show. But, I mean, yeah, uh, but it, this it's is, a bad thing. Yeah, this is all um, you know, new territory. Um, we we haven't had these uh, large models uh, interacting with the world like this before, so we we're learning as we go. Um, but there is that element of that 
um, as you say, the the tribalism and um, you know interjection. You know, we 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 see it. Um, you know, I know this is uh, some debate, but in with X and Twitter, um, you know, there there was a. a you know, part of the motivation for, for Musk coming into Twitter, it would appear, is that he felt like that um, the more conservative political views were not well represented on the platform. But when we look at um, the, 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 the correlation of, you know, the, uh, um, the right-wing um, discussions in the United States, you know, particularly during COVID and, and the pandemic and, and so forth, when we look at disinformation, it tended to come more from um, the the right wing uh, side of the aisle, um, from a news perspective, and so forth. So, this this concept of objective truth it is something that we are going to have to deal with in parallel to the development of artificial intelligence, and that that seems a, a real challenge. So, you know, how do we how do we get around the issues of, as you say, tribalism and these sorts of uh, biases that creep in for political or social reasons to something that is a reframing of the ethical experience of humanity that does try to create a not an objective truth but a um well i guess yeah an objective uh, um sort of knowledge set you know rather than allow concepts that could be damaging to the coherence of human society and so forth i know that's a very big question but yeah. Well, it's a good question, Brett, and, and it is complicated. So I believe freedom of speech is not just limited to political biases and things of that nature, and, and those are really obvious. I think also the direction of humanity, the direction of science. So science is never pursuing truth or facts. That's more the the province of a religion or or a philosophical system. Science is observation and confirmation of observation. And the better the the better you have a world where you can ask any question and pursue it, the better the world becomes. So we can go back to the with the, the quote unquote dark ages and before the uh the Italian Renaissance. And uh we can even go further back the if it was not for Sufis and the Arab culture holding on to the the brains of humanity during the Dark Ages, we would have not have known about mathematics and a lot of a lot of Greek and Roman culture, which was essentially being lobotomized out of yeah. our history. And and they they held on to it. And not only that, they invented most of it. So right. that got transferred as algebra as almost a, with algebra, et cetera, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and astronomy. Astronomy literally would not exist in its form that Galileo could have uh used if it wasn't for those observations that were recorded in, in Arabic languages at that pe period of time. So they held humanity's database during the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages were a, a a a pursuit of truth, a pursuit of only one version of truth. The Renaissance exploded because what happened was science or the idea of science that observation and confirmation of observation should be le leading society, and we they almost made them into fools. And 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 uh, you know Galileo left. Uh, a, a finger in a jar for all of eternity. And it's uh, the middle finger. And <laughs> that's exactly what it, it it represents. What he, what he basically said is you guys were fools. You wouldn't look through the telescope just to see the planets that I saw out there. And we are experiencing that today. And right. so a, a lot of people will ask, well, why do you, why are like you a so collective into... ignorance almost a, a chosen ignorance, chosen to, ignorance, a, a, like, you know, like that's the thing, you know, you talk about the whole flat earth thing, you know, and, and you look, you look at Jupiter, you look at Saturn through, through a telescope and you don't need a particularly powerful telescope to see these planets, certainly with Mars. And you can see this spherical. Right. And so yeah. how can you come to the conclusion, like, as you say, science is is observation and evidence. You know, it's clearly that, you know, gravitational forces acting create create spherical uh, bodies. 
stars, comets, asteroids, uh, planets, and so forth. So how can you come up with this sort of, you know, uh, Stone Age concept and, and still believe that when under direct observation you can see this? But people, people have, there's been a real resurgence of people believing in sort of flat Earth recently, but, it, but it's against all, all available evidence almost. Brett, this is why I love all your all of your books and what you do is you're making a lot of information, science, ideas, thoughts more relatively available, popularizing it, you know, and, and the people that have popularized science and technology have moved society forward just as much as the scientists themselves. This is a valuable, valuable function because, you know, and I, I might include myself in this is that we, we try to translate what we know is phenomenal that's taking place right in front of you, pure magic. And we're trying to break it down into practical things. Yeah. We have failed. We have failed. If there are more people that are believing certain types of theories, you know, listen, I'm not, I'm the last person to question anybody's theory. In fact, I don't like ridicule at all. I think ridicule ultimately, even Galileo said ridicule failed him because he tried to use ridicule to get people into looking to, into the telescope. It actually deserved him. So ridicule doesn't work. What it does work is, is unfortunately patience and the mm -hmm. understanding that people are living into the reality of their own body, right? And if they were not exposed to the things you and I were exposed to, it's very easy to forget that we came up through a period of time where there was Star Trek, there was science, there was Nova, there was Cosmos. There were all of these different things that were just feeding our minds. And a lot of the young folks coming up right now have not experienced these things. They've had technology dropped on their lap right? and they're trying to make sense of it. And it's an open experiment. Social media always has been an open experiment. And what happened is we haven't found a path out of that because mm. that's a quagmire. Social media in and of itself is a self-reflecting quagmire. AI might lead us out and lead it out, lead us out in a way that our personal AIs are saying, hey, there's something else going on. Here's what you here's what you want to do as a personal avatar guiding you through life. That's why it's got to be local, it's got to be personal, it's got to be away from the internet, meaning that it only gets information that you re are retrieving, but the model is built by you so that yeah. it is reflecting the goals and ambitions that you want. And of course, we work on that forever. We're always a work in progress. You know, the things that we thought we wanted to do when we were 25 are not the things you're going to want to do when you're 55. And, and that's you know, why you, you're you, constantly growing. Yeah. I mean, but you, you may have, um, you know, for example, you may have, an element, you're going to have quite a unique element of trust with your personal AI because it's that extension of your consciousness. So if your personal AI could challenge some of your conventional wisdom or thinking and sort of set you back on the track, that would be obviously extremely helpful. But that sort of brings up a broader topic and maybe we finish this segment with this is um, you know, we see a lot of efforts at regulation of artificial intelligence today um, to try and reduce risk, uh, you know, to society. But where do we get sort of the ethical conduct or the ethical framing that needs to come into AI to ensure that we don't have the same problems that we've had with social media, that we can create sort of a global set of ethics or behaviors that are an attempt at an objective truth. Wow. So I look at nature, the, the most powerful thing that we have to help our, our human family uh, deal with fear is light, sunlight. Uh, we had fear developed because we did not know what that sound was when we were in our village, in our community, in the savanna. We didn't know if that was an approaching danger. So we have a flee, fight, or freeze reaction, a limbic system, lower echelon type of reaction to things that we don't know. So the best way to fix this is not regulation, but sunlight. Now, I'm not anti-regulation. What I am saying is the regulation I've seen right now is childish to the better part. It's uh, it's reductive, it re reductive in a sense that it's going to limit the growth of this technology to a greater degree. And it overtly 
introduces people that have absolutely no idea what technology is, but have seen a couple of dystopian movies and they think it's Terminator and Matrix. You got the polar opposites. You got the Terminator people, you got the Matrix people. So the very first question you have to ask anybody is what is the what is the, the fear? What is the, the, the destruction that you think it's going to be? And let's go down that list and let's erase the ones for a moment that come from movies. Let's look at practical right. things. Yeah. Well, it's going to say bad things. Well, people say bad things. Well, it's going to show you how to do bad things. Well, I can go on the open web and pretty much do a lot of sure. bad things from a Google search. Now, I'm not talking dark web. I'm not right. advocating that an AI model do dark web stuff. But you have you have bureaucrats and regulators that are sitting there saying, ha, now we got control over this canvas. Let's make it into one little dot. And you, before you get through this dot, you're going to have to answer a whole lot of questions. Why are you asking this question? What are you going to do with it? Um, yeah. That looks a whole lot like the way the world looked before the Dark Ages. Um, and it does, does not look like the world that got us here, which was the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. The Renaissance and the Enlightenment, well, guess what happened? Um, books that were considered very dangerous, the Quran, the Bible, uh, they were banned. And it wasn't until the Gutenberg press, right? But during the dark ages, you couldn't have access right. to that. These were holy documents. You can't right. read them. It was them. only held by the priests and the clergy. By the elite. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and we weren't taught to read. The world changed. The world opened up when the Gutenberg press was invented. And all of these, and again, whatever one feels about religion, these were the first fundamental documents that brought humanity as a whole out of darkness. And they were able to own knowledge. And Wisdom Keeper is another, you know, it's another lo yeah. large leap from that. You're able to hold knowledge in your hand. And that opened up humanity. And a lot of it was controversial. In fact, most of it was. Benjamin Franklin, he, he, had, a, he had to write it under a pen name because everything he said at that moment was controversial and was a death penalty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, let's take a quick break, and I want to. I do want to continue that conversation about how the renaissance um, of human behavior that might emerge from artificial intelligence, because that that sort of awakening of uh, the human species made possible by this these these incredible capabilities in terms of reasoning and so forth at AI potentially can bring us but you're listening to beyond banking we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back with brian romley talking about how ai is going to change the world and change our culture welcome back to beyond banking brought to you by cbd talks i am your host brett king um brian before the break we were talking about the you know birth of ai as as we think of it today and um, in in respect to um, sort of these changes that are, are going to take place, you describe the process of the Gutenberg Press. And um, this is really when we, when we think about the sort of moment in humanity and how AI is going to take us forward, we are suddenly going to have sort of ubiquitous intelligence access. You know, people, uh, you know, for highly technical concepts like understanding physics and understanding, um, you know, biology and things like that, we suddenly will have access to a platform that will give us, you know, like we've got the internet, but now it can be curated contextually and things like that. But at the same time, we see artificial intelligence starting to fill in the gaps. We see it starting to help us understand um, or analyze data in a, and, and, and analyze information in a very different way, finding connections that we haven't been able to find, you know, uh, understanding protein development, understanding, um, you know, uh, uh, approaches, for example, in treatment of cancers and things like that, that, you know, we are seeing revolutionary breakthroughs because of artificial intelligence right now. So maybe... Um, start with helping us understand what is the renaissance that is going to come 
from artificial intelligence? What, what does that look like in terms of taking us from this process where we have these, you know, the, the rise of these autocratic regimes, you know, we have the populist movement and so forth as a response to the obvious pressure the world is under, the climate change, inequality, you know, um, you know the cost of living crisis that we're living through globally, all of these things. And, and we're about to throw artificial intelligence in the mix. That's going to change the, that's going to change work forever. All of these things. It, it's like, we, it does feel like a moment in time where a lot of the conventions that we've had, particularly in the industrial age are breaking and we're moving to something new. We're going to have to adapt. You know, we're going to have to change. Um, as we record this right now, the COP28 uh, um, discussions are going on in, in um, UAE, obviously. Um, and, and, you know, our response to all of these things are uh, going to be remembered for generations to come in the future because of the, the epic changes we see on the planet. But where is AI in this mix in terms of this sort of creating of this renaissance that you talk about? Well, uh, first, very complex, but uh, I think we can kind of slim it down to history has given us sort of a guideline. We know that with the invention of the portable book or the affordable book uh, and, and mass production of that knowledge across all uh, economic um, uh, levels, has completely changed and transformed our society. In fact, we would say the uh, the industrial age really began at the beginning of the ability of portable information. Because after the holy books were produced, what came next were technical books, how to do things that knowledge that you did not have access to. We forget that the concept of a university or the concept of universal education was non-existent. Most people were right, illiterate. Yeah. That that does not mean they were dumb, but they were illiterate. And uh, for and we talked about some of the reasons why. Uh, but that was no longer in 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 a uh, home in their house. They can start training their children to read and to think bigger thoughts. When we have access to a whole lot of ideas, and I say science fiction. We'll fast forward to science fiction from the forties on to the sixties. Got us to the moon. Because the people that yeah. were able to expand their mind through science fiction were able to dream of to a different place. To believe it was possible. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And the challenges that we face is a challenge of imagination right now. We are locked in. And your books open up this idea of, wow, we can see a different world. It's right there in grasp. But you have to spread that message wide and far that there, here is one way that the future can play out. It doesn't have to be dark. It doesn't have to be dystopian. And it turns out that even when it's dark for a thousand years, somebody lights a candle. I hope we don't have darkness for a thousand years. I'm doing everything I can while I'm on this place to make sure that doesn't happen. But even though there's a possibility that humanity is going to transcend that. And there are people that are opening those, those lights for us to see. So one of the things is that we must become lifelong learners and lovers of new knowledge and, and, and being able to cast aside the things that no longer serve us. This is not only a thing for us to adapt into the future, it's a personal hygiene thing that we need to do as a culture since technology has come around. We haven't had to do it very often because our jobs seem secure. Now that our jobs are no longer secure, most people define themselves by what they do. Right, you meet somebody. Hey, what's your name? What do you do? And that's not a put down that we're so vain and single minded. It's it's a commonality where we connect with other people. But you meet anybody that's lost their job or lost their occupation, they are broken for a while, sometimes forever. I've had some friends that have lost their careers and they're broken forever, and 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 it's very hard to see. And it's one of the reasons why. I work on the Wisdom Keeper and the Intelligence Amplifier because you are not your job. You're much more than that. And we have to show the world, what does it look like? You know, we're already on a spaceship, right? We, we dream about going to, you know, space and Mars. We're already on a spaceship. It's called Earth. And we have to start looking at it as one family on one spaceship 
with a lot of weird aunts and uncles that we got to deal with. We don't hate the people in our family. We better not. You hate somebody yeah. in your family, fix that right now. Um, and that means your greater family. We have to move away from hatred and move towards love. This is, I mean, this is a very philosophical conversation, yeah. but the problems that we have in the world today, you know, we seem to be pulling further apart. But if you look at the great philosophers, you know, Aristotle, Plato, et cetera, over time, one of the consistent messages is that for humanity to thrive, for humanity really to, um, to reach our full potential, we have to work together. And, and, yeah. you know, this is, um, this is something that right now seems uh, impossible, but we're going through a very small window of time where social media and the internet and all of these things have, have created very accessible conflict, um, you know, and, and debate, but to, to really create a platform for us all to, um, find common purpose and move humanity forward, you, you do need some sort of consensus building mechanism. So is AI going to help us build consensus or is it more about AI being a partner with humanity, giving us directionality? Well, so I think AI becomes a great flashlights, shining light in dark spaces, because you can start seeing the world through a different lens. And you can sort of experiment with looking at those things that you're afraid to look at and, and, and seeing the things that you're afraid of. My reason for making all forms of communication language open and unedited is because you get to see it raw, you get to see what it really looks like. And once you see people for what they are in their ugliness, you can also see their beauty because within all ugliness is insecurity. I've not met anybody with an ugly idea that isn't insecure. And that's a family problem. That's yeah. a teenage problem that you you know, you want to take somebody out somewhere else because they believe something different. You're insecure with yourself. And that's not a bad thing. It's a human thing. And we need to embrace that reality that we're fallible humans, we're emotional creatures, and that people have differing opinions because of their experience inside the thing we call a body, you know, and their experiences kind of control their outlooks. If, if you and I were raised in a different part of the world, our outlooks are going to be somewhat different. That's a reality. We need to accept that. AI can open the door to that. The internet already started that. But it was, mm. it's been weaponized against ourselves. We're literally yeah, beating although, ourselves you know, in like, the head. You, we do have like TikTok and stuff like this where we are living people's lives vicariously through these, um, you know, heavily curated. Uh, it's a really know, curated. Three-minute yeah. clips, right? Um, but I, I do think there is a um, th there is some real potential here to show people, you know, how to walk in other people's shoes, as they say, um, you know, through this. But from a broader perspective, let's talk about the scientific advances and the technological advances that AI are likely to bring us. We have one element is the agency element where you'll have, um, you know, your intelligence amplifier slash wisdom keeper that forms the basis of a personal artificial intelligence that can act on your behalf. So that seems like a fairly sim simple thing to train AIs to do, which is once an AI understands your behavior, and these, these are in many respects behavioral models, that sending your AI, AI out to act on your behalf, to execute on simple things like paying your bills, transactions, you know, helping you um, uh, in terms of your um, wellness, and um, you know actions around that coaching you to help you be healthier you know both uh, physically and, and mentally we can see those sorts of things playing out um, but let's talk about ai from a more systemic perspective how you know let, let's talk about a day in the life of someone in the mid 2030s how is ai going to be impacting their world on a daily basis wow so I'm going to be conservative. I'm going to base it on everything I know already exists and extrapolate from that and no new inventions. So from that notion is you will wake up and you will have a summary of the things that are important to you. There will be no doom scrolling. 
and, and, unless you have allocated that you want to doom scroll, but you're going to know that th that's what you're doing. Uh, you're going to be able to reflect in the mirror those things that you do and say, you know, is that a productive use of my time? That's not going to be you saying that. It's going to it's going to be your your art your your intelligence amplifier. So you'll get a summary of the things that are important, along with the novelty of the things that you don't know that you think are important. This is vital. You can't just have the things that you constantly go to and then just go down a hole. Uh, I do this. I, I've conducted research, Brett, with people over the last 30 years is I, I said, I want to start sending you things that are diametrically opposed to your view. Not that I agree with them. I'm just I'm, I'm experimenting and I want to see how it changes you on a test. So I test people over the course of six months. It expands their world outlook. It doesn't change. I don't want to change anybody. I want to expand your mind. Don't change. Grow, grow. Right. So that's all that we're doing. If I if, if I believe something yesterday and tomorrow I'm saying something else, I grew and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. You prune sometimes. Sometimes you need sifting. Sometimes your season is at the bottom of the monomyth, uh, the Joseph Campbell's hero journey. And you've ex extracted everything from your life. And it is one thing. That's great. Now you're on a, you know, on a fasting mental diet. and You're coming back up. So AI will help you do that. So you wake up, you get this summary, and then you get sort of directionals about what your day is going to be. What's your day going to be like? Well, you're probably going to be working with AI all day long, but not one, hundreds, your own. Even your own is going to be a multitude. There's going to be one master, sort of, uh, that will direct to these other AIs. But your work AI is not going to be your local AI. Your banking AI is not going to be your AI. Right. So my agent AI is going to interact with my banking agents AI, and it's going to be right. a beautiful interaction. There's going to be marketing. There's going to be, hey, we got this new product. All the things I don't want to hear necessarily because I don't have right. time. And your AI will be able to decide if it should pass that information through to you or whatever, right? It is a wonderful extension to where we've been. So commercials and advertising will go to people. It will be sifted to the ones that really want it. And it will be literally nearly 100% accurate. And it doesn't have to be forced. It's not like, okay, I'm going to use Google AI and they're going to inject a Google link inside of that. That's old thinking. New thinking right. is if I was Google, I'd hire me and I'd say, let's build the AI where it is so good at figuring out what you want that it lets the right things in the pipeline. So every time you're being fed things that you definitely wanted without giving highly, up- Highly optimized, highly personalized experiences that or, you know that we know guarantee can fit your criteria, your needs at the minute, contextual, highly contextual as well, which you know, it, it removes the concept of spam, right? Because you know, finally- Finally, we get the ability to filter all this stuff out, you know, because we get overwhelmed with so much information every day. You know, if you're in the digital, uh, um, you know, world, you know, you get overwhelmed with so much information. So then determining, you know, what is important for you functionally day to day, that's going to be a huge improvement. But it, it does, you know, there there is um, potential for bias to creep in here as well. We've seen mm -hmm. this with AI models. Um, we see AI models that can express, um, you know, gender bias, that can express uh, racial bias and things like that. You know, let's not forget uh, Microsoft Tay uh, back in the <laughs> yeah. early days and things like that. Um, but, you know, so it sort of seems like th there is this conflict or balance that's going to be required. And, and I, I sort of come back in my thinking on this, I've always come back to the fact that we need some sort of ethical guide rails or codes of conduct for AI to operate safely within, within that respect. But it, on that point, you've spent a lot of time over the last uh, couple of months dealing with the fallout of the Sunanigans at OpenAI and uh, the replacement of uh, Sam Altman as CEO and then the restoration of Altman as the CEO and that's created some angst for corporate clients and so forth but let me uh, ask you this um, you know when when we're looking at 
the the issue of open AI, there has been a debate around whether or not, um, you know, this is because open AI is pushing so hard to get the AI built rather than looking at those ethical considerations and concerns and making sure that those are, are worked out. So, um, you know, in terms of these massive models, there still seems to be a real question about what is driving the creation of these massive AI platforms. Is it just purely commercially driven or can it be seen in context of what it's going to do for humanity? So, you know, given the open AI issue that's recently occurred, uh, you know, are you concerned about the directionality of these AI programs and the need to inject ethics and, you know, human continuity and so forth in, into the mix? I absolutely am on a number of different levels. Uh, let me talk commercially first, because it uh, directly affected me when uh, Sam Altman was fired. Um, I have a lot of clients. Uh, some of them are publicly traded companies, very large companies, and they've reached out to me. It's not my prime mission in life, but I, I do consult quite a bit in uh, helping companies identify avenues of using AI within their organization. They're cutting edge companies, even though they might be older, some are banks that want to maximize the use of AI as quickly as possible. Now that's a, that's a noble thing. And what we try to do is we try to make all the considerations from a security standpoint, pri primarily and fundamentally, and a usability. And typically as soon as we install AI, and, and start using it, we're looking at millions of dollars in savings, not by firing a single person. And it's one of the directives I sort of start with when, when people are approaching me is, I'm not here to eliminate jobs. I'm here to make everybody's job 10 times more powerful. And we're going to work department by department on how to do that with their staff. When Sam Altman was fired, just before Thanksgiving uh, weekend, I had hundreds of people that I've consulted with, some are active. What do we do now? Uh, we've committed millions of dollars to open AI and we don't even know what's going on with the company. And I'm like, I don't get into soap opera, but you know, a CEO of a publicly traded company called me on Sunday and he essentially said, listen, I don't care about the soap opera either. I have to answer to a lot of people that I've committed millions of dollars to a company that will not explain what happened. So right. what happened at open AI is indicative of what goes on in startups, but they're trying to sell seats at a uh, enterprise product and they feel like they can just flip us all off and say, well, he got fired and now he's back, ha ha ha. Now we can just talk about other things. Sorry, this is a real world with real people that can lose jobs over this because they recommended it. You need an explanation and the longer you take, the more likely you have sent the business elsewhere. And that happened. So that's part problem one. Problem two is, I have no idea what went on inside there, but I do know this. What some people are claiming is AGI, artificial general intelligence, or even artificial super intelligence, will probably come and go, and a lot of people won't recognize it because mm. our definitions are going to constantly change. Right. What we do need to do is have an open dialogue of everybody who should be at this table, not just scientists, not just politicians, because it's scientists and politicians usually. We need much more than that. We need people who have been versed in history, uh, you know, psychology, a lot of, you know, poets. Everybody needs to be at this table to start talking about this subject. The people who are at the table right now talking about AI safety are the wrong people, Brett. They're absolutely yeah. the wrong people yeah, and yeah. they're making the wrong decisions right now. Yeah. Well, lots, lots to think about, um, lots to uh, talk about. Um, but AI seems to be directionally, it's very clear now this is where humanity is going in terms of the use of artificial intelligence. And we've got to tweak some things out and there's going to be some advancements. Um, but let's maybe just finish with some conjecture it is, you know, and I know this is a, a, a big uh, area, but you, you do have your finger on the pulse. And, you know, you talked about expert systems earlier, you know, uh, um, being sort of the foundational elements of the way we thought about AI back in the 80s and so forth. 
And then Jeffrey Hinton came along and came up with this concept of, you know, machine learning and deep learning. But how uh, is there is there anything on the horizon that is likely to change the way we are training and um, building these models that will become the foundation of AI in the future that goes beyond um, you know, typical machine learning? Yeah, I mean, uh, baby steps that I go to, uh, to to the far end that I'm dealing with my clients for right now, trying to have them adjust to this future. Um, it, just in the next couple of, uh, say, months and years is a mixture of experts type of AI, where you're having not just one, but maybe dozens of AI specialty into different environments. That's how GPT-4 does so well. It's a mixture of 16 very large experts. Uh, on your own computer, you'll have maybe 30, 60 of them in different segments, medical, you know, uh, sciences, things like that. Uh, so that's that's the very first thing, and that's going to speed things up. It's also going to help us with the safety issues of hallucination and saying things that don't make sense. The, the various experts will vote out what's going on inside of AI. This is a really big uh, uh, milestone. The other thing is what Gemini, uh, the real Gemini Ultra that, that was announced by Google, it's a, a multimodal model built from the ground up to process audio, video, and text all at once inside the same model, not you know putting it out to right, different models right. of function. GPT-4 uh, puts out functionality to uh, image generation to uh, a diffusion type model. Uh, these new models are going to be the future and we're seeing that already with uh, local models uh, open source. Finally, nano fabrication is an AI story. This is being able to build anything uh, atom by atom, molecule by molecule. We already have some of the what, beginning what companies. What Star Trek called the replicator concept. The replicator concept. Uh, this is an AI uh, territory, and a lot of people don't see it this way. AI is going to help us fabricate things and build things that we already have. And I'm talking food. I'm talking computers. I'm talking almost everything. Uh, they're just atoms. And nanofabrication merged with AI, it's happening already, but we'll start seeing the real wow. reality of that at the end of 2024. So that's the future. Wow, that's uh, not place. far away, man, you know, 2024 for nano uh, replicator. The beginnings of it. Yeah, the yeah. beginnings. It's not going to be the real deal. I'm no, no, I, I understand that. Well, you know, even 3D printing, you know, we had the concept of 3D printers that could print themselves, you know, um, so uh, I saw a meme on this the other day, go buy a 3D printer, print a 3D printer and return the 3D <laughs> printer, you know, like um, as, a, as a concept. But, um, you know, the ability to print off a new smartphone and things like that, it really does change the world because the con whole consumerism, if you have access to the raw material, you can sort of build anything. We think about that in terms of healthcare, you know, in terms of like, generating replacement uh, organs for yourself and things like that. There's so many huge changes that are going to come from, from these technologies, but Brian, Brad, it's, it's going to make this period look like child's play I because know, we're all going to have to mature to deal oh, yeah, with. Yeah. Like even just our models of politics and economics, you know, I Everything. talk about, I talked about this recently is why super AI is going to be the end of capitalism and the capitalists lose their mind over that <laughs> yeah. stuff, you know, but the reality is that if you have all of these systems, highly autonomous systems that can create better life and more wealth and better resource utilization and so forth. We need a different framing economically to think about this. The, 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 um, you know, uh, the collection of assets and things like this, a lot of that becomes meaningless in um, framing of, of an AI led world. And I don't think people really understand where that's going. But Brian, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for uh, giving us your time today. How can people keep up with your musings on this? I know you've got a great newsletter that you put out that um, you know people subscribe to all around the world. Um, but tell us a little bit more about that and how people can stay in touch with you. Thank you, Brett. It's such an honor to be here. And I, I, I miss our talks. Uh, read Multiplex, R-E-A-D, multiplex.com is where I put out a lot of these ideas, the age of abundance that we're all going to be seeing. And uh, follow me on Twitter at my first and last name and uh, connect. We're all, we're all growing through this together. Absolutely. Brian Romley, thanks for joining us on Beyond Banking today and uh, keep in touch, my friend. Thank you. 
Thank you.